When I was a young teenager, I remember learning about my generation for the first time. I had always known my grandparents were silent generation, and my parents were baby boomers, but to me, I felt generationally agnostic. It didn't seem like you were given a generation until you were old enough to have kids. Once you became a homeowner, a consumer in suburban hell, then you're worth categorizing, while well, your kids got to spectate. But I was graduating middle school, and if there's one thing about being 13, it's that you must put everyone into categories, and you need to give the freshmen as many insecurities as possible. It was then my friend told me a new way in which the freshmen below us didn't measure up. They were a different generation than us, according to some website he pulled up in the computer lab. The website claimed these disgusting freshmen were members of the iGen by virtue of being born in 2001, while the rest of us were at the very end of Gen Y, born in 1998 or 99. Because of course, being born in 1999 versus 2001 are distinctly different experiences somehow. I don't think I could even strive to be as petty as the average middle school student. But as the years went by, I iGen rebranded to Gen Z, thank God, and we became part of Gen Z as the years solidified into their final 1997 to 2012 birth range. Once a generation becomes part of our collective awareness, the previous generations begin crafting a narrative, but it seems older people are struggling to put Gen Z into a box more than previous cohorts. Millennials have been branded as lazy college graduates who just love being scanned by their landlords, but nobody seems to know what to do with us Zoomers. While millennials are seen as lazy and self-entitled, Gen Z is unhinged, feral, and profusely diagnosed with mental illness. As an elder member of Gen Z, I kind of like being seen as a bit feral. It seems better than a submissive beta who can't handle their job without quiet quitting. At least being seen as unhinged makes people fear us a little, but there is a darker side to this too. As someone once said, Gen Z is too afraid to ask a waiter for extra ketchup, but will happily body slam a cop. While we're known for our spitfire personalities and can single-handedly cancel out the boomer vote in elections, we're not exactly thriving. Some statistics claim as much as 42% of Gen Z adults have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Aside from the online activism we've become well known for, we use social media to communicate through art trends or online aesthetics. If you've been online in the past year or two, you've probably seen this liminal space trend. Liminality is generally defined as ambiguity or vagueness, a state of transition between concepts where the contours of the situation are not fully understood. Take the experience of liminality, express it through a location, and you have a liminal space. A quintessential liminal space is usually a public, commercial, or retail space from the 90s or 2000s, but with an uncanny or dreamlike quality to them. Usually they're barren, abandoned as if they've been perfectly frozen for 20 years, but forgotten all the same. There's a lot of related trends or aesthetics as well, such as Weirdcore, which is expressly focused on the uncanny nature of early digital photography and computer graphics. There's also The Backrooms, which is a whole internet legend of endless office buildings that exist just outside of our world, complete with indie games and films based on the concept. You might even say Vaporwave was a precursor to this trend, but perhaps focused on a slightly earlier time period. The thing is, I've seen people resonate with liminal spaces and the associated aesthetics a bit intensely. Sure, some people enjoy things like the back rooms purely as a fantasy horror story, but a lot of people are weirdly emotional about pictures of dead malls or suburban housing from the 2000s. Take a look at Weirdcore. Sure, there's underpinnings of nostalgia, but what's front and center is existential pain. There's a desire to escape into these images, into a world more primitive than our own. In fact, I think I've been yearning through online art movements for around 10 years now. Long before Liminal was an internet trend, 
I was a teenager breaking into abandoned buildings, trying to capture this uncanny feeling of a lost era for a Tumblr page. I ran my photos through dozens of filters and 90s tech to give them a distorted edge, and generally was obsessed with capturing this vibe. You'd think with how much time I put into capturing this aesthetic, it would have given me a good feeling, but I didn't feel anything beyond a twisted mix of nostalgia and existential pain. I'm an older member of Gen Z, so maybe I'm biased here, but I'm noticing this intense yearning by proxy of nostalgia is really common for people my age. I think that's why this type of internet trend seemingly won't go away. A lot of millennials were just entering adulthood as Vaporwave hit the scene in the early 2010s, and with each passing group of 18 to 25 year olds, it seems like the aesthetic trends get fuzzier and fuzzier, more and more dreamlike. I think the current group of 18 to 25 year olds are having to reach really far back in their memories to remember a time when they weren't miserable. For example, if you're 23, your memories of something like a vibrant mall mostly exist from when you were under the age of 8, before the 2008 financial crisis began wiping them out. Many of us Gen Z adults had our suburban fantasies crushed once the financial crisis robbed us of our homes, leaving behind spotty liminal memories of a big mansion that once felt safe. Gen Z is hurting, and we aren't even dealing with it in expected ways. We aren't sleeping around and partying, we're sitting alone rotting in front of the computer and nobody can agree on why this is. So in this episode of Finding Subtext, I'll be looking at what went wrong with our generation, why are we all so miserable now, along with what our unusual art and social trends like liminal spaces are trying to express. Let's get into this. This idea of categorizing people by generations has always been a tool of two industries, journalism and marketing. The second we can vaguely agree on a time frame and put a name to it, consulting firms swoop in and synergize their way to analysis. When the youngest Zoomers were just one year old, we already had marketing firms claiming we like to think in 4D whatever that means, and our attention spans have grown so short that we'll be consumers of snack media. Ten years later, that one kinda panned out, actually. <laughs> Obviously, taking every human born within a 15-year span and making sweeping statements about them has its limitations. Someone born in 2012 has a much different life experience than someone born in 1997. Firstly, those of us born in 1997 are four years from turning 30 years old. I feel myself becoming geriatric by the second. Second. Meanwhile, 2012 Zoomers are currently in the fifth grade. Even trying to compare shared experiences gets tough. Today's fifth graders have accomplished years of formative education fully remotely. While computers in my elementary schools looked like this, and the schoolwork was seldom digital until high school, kids born in 2012 would have had their mushy toddler brains shaped by the YouTube algorithm on their iPads. They probably have the videos of Elsa getting pregnant just seared onto their developing frontal lobes. Whereas the closest thing I had was my father's Palm Pilot. Remember Palm Pilots? Those were awful, hence why I spent most of my childhood outside. <laughs> my point is, our early childhoods were quite a bit different. But one thing unifies us. We both had smartphones from a relatively young age. Smartphones and the internet they're connected to are truly a technological marvel and obviously changed a lot about how we live our lives. While I feel like a used up 80 year old inside, I have to remind myself that I I've had a computer since I was like five years old. I genuinely can't imagine functioning without the internet. If you're like me and somehow are not 30 yet, can you really imagine doing something like a road trip in 1980? I think I wouldn't survive one. I can remember a time before smartphones, but I still had MapQuest where I could print out an exact route to a destination. Boomers were just raw dogging it, buying maps from gas stations and making their own routes. And what happens if you get lost and don't have a map? Do you just 
run out of gas? Like, I don't get it. What if the only gas station you can find doesn't have the map you need? Do you just get stranded? Not to mention, what if you can't find a payphone when an emergency happens? What if you get into a car accident? How do you call the police? I got my first cell phone when I was five, and sure, it looked like this and was a terrible hand-me-down, but at least I could call the police if I really needed something. The thing is, I understand all of my questions have answers. Just like I can't imagine life without cell phones, and the internet, today's kids would probably have a stroke if I handed them my old Palm Pilot. Or if I tried to explain to them that when I was their age, I racked up a $300 bill from using too many minutes and hitting the internet key on my phone too many times. Or if I told them that having a GPS in your car was really fancy when I was a kid. But that's the thing, each generation becomes reliant on the technology they're raised with. Gen Z has become reliant on cell phones, internet, and computers. And then they merged into one device that works everywhere. Smartphones sound like a godsend, something our ancestors would have done anything to have. Yet, they've become the thing we blame our problems on. As soon as the selfie camera was added to phones when I was, like, in middle school, I've been lectured tirelessly about how kids are so addicted to our phones, we'll have no chance in life. But maybe they were onto something. Smartphones and social media kind of felt like a turning point in my life. I had a rough upbringing, but I still had some level of joy and zest for life until the early 2010s. The world really should have ended in 2012, honestly. Smartphones are constantly blamed by every generation alike. It's probably the one thing boomers and zoomers can agree on. The problem is these god phones. There is some objective, provable truth to that. Becoming nearsighted or having myopia is increasingly associated with heavy smartphone use. I guess, like, the 12-year-old version of me should have really listened. Unfortunately, our eyes weren't built to stare 10 inches from our face all day. In fact, a lot of our body wasn't built for phone use. The blue light emitted from screens has been proven to prevent quality sleep. I just choose to ignore that fact while I binge on melatonin gummies and other types of gummies every night. At this point, we know smartphones and social media are doing something to our brains. We just aren't quite sure what yet. Whatever it's doing to us, it doesn't look good, especially for those of us with brains still developing. I mean, recently I've seen multiple viral TikToks about people growing mushrooms in their ears because they left their earbuds in for days at a time. I don't think that's a sign of a healthy attachment to your smartphone. For me, the world felt like it began to dull as soon as these stupid black boxes began to rule our lives. I still remember lining up to buy my first iPhone with my own money. This would have been around 2012, maybe 2011. From there on out, I became entrenched in social media, just as it started to develop a chokehold on adolescents. Sure, the millennials before me had MySpace and my yearbook, and I actually did use those on my computer a few times, but social media becoming mobile made it that much more insidious. Posting a photo to MySpace was like a rocket engineering level advanced task by the standards of current children. You had to get a digital camera, software to put it onto your computer, and then you had to upload the files, and there were just barriers of entry with social media that disappeared with smartphones. Many of us only had one family computer sitting in the living room. Even those of us with a personal computer often had to deal with parental oversight with how much screen time we had. Meanwhile, in the early 2010s, it seemed like most parents didn't understand how capable smartphones really were, and you could use them anywhere as much as you wanted. I made an Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr page when I got my iPhone, and from there on out, my classmates were suddenly accessible 24-7. With social media, my after-school interactions weren't just with friends whose contact information I had written down. Now I could reach basically any acquaintance I could imagine, and they could reach me. Maybe it was just my school or something, but 2011 to 2012 felt like a massive turning point in everything becoming connected. Everyone just suddenly had smartphones in the new school year, and I remember it felt like it made sense. We were 13 and could truly embrace our newfound desire for teenage independence and do whatever we wanted with the internet at our fingertips, all without our parents knowing. It didn't take long before I had my first experiences with cyberbullying. I was mistakenly added to a Skype group chat where all my 
friends were talking about how much of an insufferable burden I was. I'm sure that moment altered my brain chemistry a bit. I was also receiving harassment from random emails and Facebook messages. When my father had a brief stint in jail around that time, I had to deal with being smeared for that online. Going to my parents about that didn't even occur to me, because what exactly are my parents gonna do about Skype DMs other than just not let me use the internet anymore? At that time, I don't think parents knew what to do with those situations. Parents understood how to deal with their kids coming home from school beat up, but having your child burst into tears at 2 a.m. over hours of harassment online is a very different situation. Most parents in 2011 were simply going to tell their kids to just get off the internet. It's just words on a screen, that sort of thing. If turning your phone off was a viable solution, we wouldn't have had thousands of teenagers ending it over what was happening to them online. While anti-cyberbullying PSAs and short films from the era were extremely out of touch, they did successfully capture the isolation of it all. I had similar experiences, moments of breaking down in my bedroom from bullying that was happening entirely online. Line. It's horrible, and I can only hope that today's parents can at least guide their kids through those situations. Cyberbullying can be worse than good old-fashioned bullying in some situations, as your harassers can hide behind a cloak of anonymity while you remain open and vulnerable. The first time I was ever doxxed, I was 14 years old on a Minecraft server. Thankfully, the address was wrong, and they only had my general identity and some family members' landline numbers. But once I was 16 and had more of a YouTube following at the time on a different channel, I got doxxed twice, and they were thorough. They had made a mostly accurate family tree with phone numbers, my high school, home address, my emails, cell number, and usernames. Staying up all night wondering if someone's gonna show up at your home is not something a child should have to experience, ever. Since then, I've been extremely private on the internet. I don't put any identifying information out there. All this isn't to mention the general state of the internet back then. It was considered funny back then to send people deceiving links. At best, you got rickrolled, but oftentimes it was an execution video on LiveLeak. The internet has since cleaned up substantially. It's now much harder to access traumatizing content. In a lot of ways, we were the guinea pigs, the first to grow up with modern social media, but without the safeguards we have today. But this was all 10 years ago, when a lot of us were children. We're not being cyberbullied in middle school anymore. We're adults who can manage our own social media habits. So how are these stupid black boxes making us depressed now? Well, that's when we tread into murky waters. Actually, not just murky, outright radioactive. When you search why is social media bad online, the results are jam-packed with hundreds of people doing what I call the guru grift. These types of creators sell courses or online guidance under the guise of self-help. I'll talk about this later in the video, but it's not a good situation. I'd go over these videos point by point, adjusting the claims and seeing if they're onto something, but I think anyone who's been on the internet in the past 10 years, or who has been lectured by an old person about their internet usage, could predict exactly what these videos claim. Social media is shallow, it's leading your kids down a bad path, it's all fake, it could even be turning your kids gay. Like, yeah, okay, boomer, I've heard all this since social media was invented, and I was successfully turned gay, so I don't really mind. Though there is one point that I actually agree with, one diamond in the rough. I think we're all onto something when we say social media is damaging to our sense of self. A common example is Instagram. We all know everyone on there is photoshopped or edited to an insane standard. Entire industries have been created around apps making it easier to meet these impossible requirements. I can't stress enough how Instagram used to be incredibly benign. Your feed consisted of entirely unflattering food pictures or your aunt's 40th birthday party. The point used to be to share whatever you're up to in real life. Nowadays, it's, well... I'm incredibly hot, rich, and nearly naked for some reason. Did you notice in the background I've been traveling to vaguely tropical location? Who cares? You're just gonna stare at this photo? Well, you We all know that what we see on our timelines is engineered to look effortlessly unattainable. I have to literally repeat to myself when I open the app. Instagram is not real life. 
but in reality, we all have a dumb, over-evolved ape brain that really can't tell the difference. No matter how much you remind yourself that social media isn't real, you can't help but feel like everyone else is living a better life. Gen Z has tried to inject some signature unhinged energy to counteract this trend, but I can't help but think the way Gen Z uses Instagram is yet another expression of wounded self-confidence. For those of you who go outside, you might not have noticed that younger adults aren't really posting highly contrived content to social media as religiously. Instead, sporadically posting weird, blurry camera dumps in an attempt to look spontaneous. While it's nice to have some timeline palette cleansers between the 12-hour Photoshop projects, I can't help but wonder, are we doing this because we're rejecting influencer culture? Or are we doing this because we've grown so self-conscious that showing a clear, unfiltered photo of ourselves in HD is too intimidating to bear. I think it's a bit of both. It's obvious most of us hate influencer culture. It felt fun when it was just a few YouTubers offering us a means of escape from our mundane lives. But now it feels like every platform is just jam-packed full of rich socialites. But here's the thing, we've always had impossible beauty standards and rich people to compare ourselves to. So why is it a problem now? Well, I'd say things got a lot worse when everyone became an influencer. In 2003, people compared themselves to magazines. In 2023, you have Jason and Becky from your hometown who made a couple's Instagram as they go backpacking across Europe. To top it all off, they've somehow bought a beautiful house in Seattle and have a baby on the way despite being 24. And you know for a fact they didn't grow up rich, so what the the f Becky? Are you running a pyramid scheme or a cult? And why is your husband so hot? Are you dating a men's fitness model? You might as well just give birth onto the red carpet with those f***ing genetics. Sorry, I think that got a little too specific and personal. My bad. It stings so much more when you can see the perfectly crafted social media presence of every acquaintance you've ever known, and they all seem to be doing so much better than you. But it gets worse, because when you try to keep up with the Joneses and film a TikTok, the app is working overtime to make Make sure you look as conventionally attractive as possible. Nearly every social app has some sort of AI filter running at all times, so the second you catch a glimpse of yourself, it's already been perfected by a computer. I can just feel the algorithm sizzling under the pressure when I open the camera. Like, it does so much to my face. On some phones, even the camera itself has been engineered to do this. On my cell phone, the second the selfie camera is activated, it triggers a skin smoothing effect, like the one on Teams or Zoom. Because yes, even your corporate meetings are airbrushed now. We use our phones as mirrors, growing increasingly unaware that what's on screen isn't a reflection, but rather a computer's interpretations of our own insecurities. After years of seeing myself through a computer, I find myself having a rude awakening every time I try to get ready in the morning. Wow. If only my mother found the coat hanger. I look like if a bunch of STIs grew into the shape of a human. I'm gonna have to get on my gay shit and learn how to contour, but the twinks at Sephora are kind of scary. Uh, maybe I can just get hit by a city bus so I can afford some plastic surgery? That might fix this, hopefully. Social media in its current form can be very damaging, and I really don't think you need me to tell you that. That being said, the dose makes the poison. If we only spent the occasional hour in our airbrushed digital utopias, we wouldn't be having this conversation. In reality, 59% of the world's population is on social media, spending an average of six hours a day on various platforms. Now, you could argue this is simply due to social media being so addictive, engineered to keep us from looking away. We really do live in a society. My wife left me because of my Venmo addiction. God, I wish I could just talk about these things without sounding like a boomer. Sure, it is true social media companies want to make money. That's literally the whole point. And aside from tampering with our political system, they make money through keeping you scrolling so you can watch ads for Chinese drop shipping or some new startup that's missing its vowels. So with profits increasing as user retention increases, these apps are going to be designed for dependence. There's many ways we do this. Things like gamification, where you design everything to work around points, tokens, interactivity, or rewards. These methods work, but I think we're all analyzing social media in a vacuum. The truth is, one in four people plan on being a social media influencer as a career. And looking at the state of the job market and the cost of college, 
I don't blame them at all. Hell, I'm Gen Z and I've been making online content since I was like seven years old. I'm definitely part of the problem, which you can support on patreon.com slash finding subtext. Please give me an escape from late stage capitalism. I will literally start camming if I have to. Because that's the thing, we're really miserable and social media could be making us a little more miserable, but the outside world is doing far worse to us and making us turn to things like social media. Am I allowed to have an OnlyFriends while working at Geico? After no raise, I'm desperate for money. This is not a joke. Instacart is dead. How do you start selling feet pics? Do they have to be my feet? Please advise. Considering selling my underwear for money, options for legitimate work are non-existent. I have a master's degree, but can't afford childcare, and the wait is nine months anyways. I need some extra cash. This sucks. In the past 10 years, as our economy reaches a breaking point, people have pursued any possible form of flexible employment to make ends meet. People start driving for Uber or making an Etsy store. If you had an art hobby, now you take commissions on Fiverr or on social media. News outlets like to frame this as young people being entrepreneurs and business savvy, but the reality is we're just monetizing every possible second of our waking lives because it is too expensive. Let's take a little field trip to a random rural state. Let's do Vermont. The median income in Vermont is $32,000 a year. After taxes, you're left with around $2,000 a month if we're being generous, and that's not including any deductions like health insurance. According to Zillow, the median rent in Vermont's small city of Burlington, where most of the jobs are, is $2,100 a month. Well, of course it's expensive in Burlington. It's a tourist town in New England, a disgusting liberal stronghold. Any smart person would live out in the country where it's affordable. Living rural would save you about $100, as the statewide median rent is still $2,000 a month. Well, yeah, renting is just paying off someone else's mortgage. Only idiots choose to rent. The average home in Vermont is $320,000. With a $15,000 down payment, that's a monthly mortgage payment of $1,900 a month. And how exactly are you going to save like $15,000 for a down payment when rent is literally more than your income? This is not just Vermont either. I picked that state completely randomly. In the neighboring state of Massachusetts, the median rent is $3,200 a month on Zillow. And the nationwide median rent is nearly $2,000 a month, with the American median income being $31,000 a year. Government assistance like food stamps or Section 8 housing is tied to the federal poverty line, which is still $14,000 a year. You would have to make less than that to be considered poor by the federal government. At some point, the government realized we could pull off low poverty metrics by just barely raising the poverty line for 40 years. I'd argue they've done this with inflation too, as food or housing costs are often kept out of inflation metrics. As is true for many things, mostly blue states are trying to pick up the slack of a government that's barely done anything since 2010. So many states are now providing assistance to those up to 200% of the poverty line. But when 200% of the poverty line is 28,000 a year before taxes or healthcare, the average person is simultaneously too poor and too wealthy to survive. With our income being so heavily tied up in housing costs, we're willing to take on a second, third, or fourth job so we don't join the 34 million Americans with food insecurity or the growing homeless population. Our desperation gives gig employers like Uber or Instacart a lot of leverage. As a result, Uber drivers make just $19 an hour and after taxes, gas, and car expenses, that's more like 10, maybe $12 an hour just for the privilege of Kaylee throwing up in your back seat on Girls' Night Out. And also, these gig jobs are only available in really expensive, highly populated cities. With such few viable options, what are young people supposed to do? A college education doesn't always yield good jobs and can easily put you in $100,000 of debt. Sure, trade school is only $15,000, but if everyone became a plumber, we'd have a lot of homeless plumbers, not to mention the fact that many people need to spend their productive hours working so they don't starve, not in a trade program that may or may not pan out in a good paying job years down the line. So people resort to selling their bodies. 
A year ago, my husband and I moved from a really large, like major metropolitan area to a dying city in the Midwest as an attempt to escape a high cost of living. It didn't work and actually financially ruined us even more, but that's besides the point. We moved to a place where religion and tradition dominates the culture. Yet even here, I've had multiple housewives tell me that they were considering getting into accounting or selling their feet pics and used underwear online. And no, I don't mean actually accounting, I just can't say the actual words. They make an only friends page about that. For these people, the desire for a side hustle wasn't driven by the pursuit of luxury, rather a longing for the simple things we once took for granted. Things like having two working cars for a household again, so they could manage grocery shopping while their husband works two jobs, or being able to afford childcare so they could afford to get a job and get out of poverty. These were topics of everyday conversation, much like how my husband openly wishes we get hit by a car to pay off our student loans every time we walk through a parking lot together. These remarks have become sort of a millennial tick. People just say that now and then move on with the conversation as if it's normal. But it's not normal. It shouldn't be normal for everyday people to wish they could sell their bodies or win a personal injury claim just for some semblance of security. So, um, I did not mean for this part of the video to sound like I was invalidating or going against anyone who has chosen a career in, let's say, um, adult performance. Like, I think that is a totally valid line of work. I think that we should do more to protect people who choose that form of employment. And it's real work. It's a real job. I realized while editing that I kind of sounded like I was shaming those types of workers and that's not at all what I was trying to do. So if you took it that way, not what I meant. Let's get back to the video. Gen Z especially hasn't really known a sense of stability. We were raised in the immediate aftermath of towers falling, growing up on a diet of graphic footage from both that and conflicts in the Middle East. The 2008 financial crisis forced millions of us out of our childhood homes. I was actually lucky by Gen Z or young millennial standards. In 2008, I didn't end up on the streets like my husband did as a child, but like many others, my parents separated and I was moved across the country being bounced between job markets. Whether it was homelessness, foreclosure, divorce, or general instability, I think a lot of us were traumatized as children. We had no control over what was happening in 2008, and I didn't even fully understand what the stock market was, let alone why it was taking my father away along with my house, friends, school, and community. Then 2012 came along, and I remember feeling like way too much was going on all at once. Grass became legal in my state, which at the time I strongly protested. There was a really tough election cycle. I was the only person in my friend group that didn't hate Obama. And most importantly, there were multiple high profile mass firing events leading to frequent active firing drills. Not to mention in 2013, my school had an attempted firing event. Thankfully, nothing came out of it aside from a few lawsuits. But growing up, passively thinking about dying over your algebra textbook can really chip away at a child, as you would expect it to. By 2016, we had another brutal election. And from there on out, regardless of what party you belong to, I think we can agree things have been unraveling since then. The 2020 situation only threw more gasoline on the fire, leading to widespread instability in every facet of life. Think about what instability feels like for a second. To me, instability feels like a lack of power. I look at the generations that came before me and I see incredible power there. Thinking back to my parents' generation, the baby boomers, the way they lived is absolutely mesmerizing to me. I was born into a single income household. On that one income earned without a high school education, my parents were able to buy not just a house, but a house that perfectly matched their preferences based on how much they wanted to spend. Like they could just leisurely buy a house they actually enjoyed with an offer below asking price with a mortgage payment that still left them able to function and live. Like they had excess money after paying the mortgage. I don't get it. They could afford professional movers to move them into the house and contractors to renovate the house every time something fell out of fashion. Like, wouldn't it be so cool to have servants that will repair things for you that you can just afford somehow? I have to do my own drywall, electrical, and plumbing repairs on my own apartment. And you're telling me my parents could just hire someone to rehab a house they just own without lifting a finger? And like, as a reminder, they would just like tear out a kitchen if it was like, ew, it's dated from the 70s. 
not like when some kind of major failure happens, like a pipe bursting and they've had damage or something. Like, like they just thought things looked dated, so they just did, like they built new things. I, I don't get it. I can't imagine living somewhere that's actually customized to me. I'm fighting for my life just to afford 500 square feet of the landlord special. The biggest apartment I've ever lived in was 650 square feet, yet my parents just owned a place with three bathrooms. Like, just make it make sense. That's wealth so abundant that it becomes world building. Not only could they afford a nice house on a few acres, but they also could have two new cars, a motorcycle, take trips to Europe, eat out regularly, have a monthly housekeeper, and afford childcare. This is just off of my father's income working IT at a phone company. He didn't graduate high school, but this was the late 90s, and all of these luxuries were pretty affordable back then. The average salary of an IT administrator in 1998 was $61,000, and today the average salary for the same job is $72,000. In 1998, the median house cost was $152,000, and today the median house price is $467,000. Rent was averaging at $500 a month, and today it's $2,000. The price of a new car averaged at $22,000. Today it's $49,000. Gas prices have increased by 300%. Private college tuition has increased from $13,000 to nearly $51,000. I could go on forever. Literally everything is disproportionately more expensive now. Wages began to stagnate in the 1970s and 80s. This was a time of union busting and trickle-down Reaganomics. But Gen Z entered adulthood at a time when everything got so much worse. It would be one thing if we were raised prepared for this. Some of us were. Many Gen Z are what's called old poor and have mastered survival without resources. But many of us elder Zoomers were raised middle class and had no idea this economic devastation was coming. We were told to get good grades, go to college, and that was the path to our parents' world-building wealth. That was the plan a lot of us prepared for up until the age of 18. But as society destabilized further, a lot of us looked around and said, oh god, I don't think I can afford college, especially in this economy. Instead of increasing each year as usual, college enrollment has gone down 6.5% in the last few years. Now, just 51% of teenagers plan on getting a year degree. In my mind, the quintessential Gen Z and millennial experience was like being guided towards a bright future, only to be stranded alone in hell. This explains the longing for a world that seemingly no longer exists, a world that's closer to what we were expecting. Sure, everyone's nostalgic for their childhoods, but haven't you noticed a bit of an unusual intensity in that nostalgia recently? First it was millennials, with the 90s kid mania of the early 2010s. Only 90s kids remember making mixtapes, man I miss when video games existed, and rubber bands I guess. My personality is a landline phone. Life hasn't been the same since corporation changed branding. Buzzfeed will pay for their sins someday. By the time the 90s kid trend fizzled away, modern social media was really building its influence, and we started communicating through art or aesthetics far more. Our memes went from text walls to just single existential images. On the early internet, everyone was insulated on saw forums or websites. People communicated directly through text-based posts. On what I'd call the modern internet, people communicate through hashtags or trends, and it's much more of a visual medium. So by the time 2014 came around and the 90s kid trend was fading, we got to see our first visual nostalgia trend, Vaporwave. The timing couldn't have been better for Vaporwave, as Tumblr was hitting its peak around this time. One of Tumblr's gimmicks was aesthetic pages. People would put ridiculous effort into HTML coding their way to the perfect vibe, and users could curate their feed by following certain styles or aesthetics. Vaporwave could get dark. There was certainly a melancholy chic to it. Vaporwave also became a music trend, where people would take sad music, add reverb, slow it down, and remix it into a long, dreary mixtape. Take Vaporwave, fill it with even more existential pain, and you have one of Gen Z's first major aesthetic trends, liminal spaces. Much like Vaporwave, it's an audiovisual aesthetic featuring loneliness and relishing the echoes of a brighter past. It's definitely somewhat fashionable right now to critique the suburbs, and trust me, I absolutely hate suburbia. That being said, I'd do just about anything for a chance to live in a 
Y2K McMansion working at a shitty office job that can comfortably pay for everything. You know those images where it's like, would you live in this cabin for a million dollars? Yeah, I'd curb stop a f***ing puppy for a McMansion. I mean, any kind of comfortable housing would be beautiful. Like having more than 500 square feet to fit both me, my husband, and like my several pets into, would be amazing, I love that. When I see a picture like this on a TikTok aesthetic page, I think, wow, that's luxury. A privileged life I was once promised, but will never obtain. As I watch my friends get deeper into their 20s and 30s, I keep hearing them joke about adulting. A lot of us are experiencing imposter syndrome, where we feel like we aren't truly capable or deserving of the roles we fill. Usually, imposter syndrome traditionally happens at work. You get some sort of new job with an upgrade in title, and then you wonder, am I really good enough to be the director of corporate synergy at Business Incorporated? But when people say something like, wow, look at me adulting, when they file their taxes, sign up for health insurance, get married, or like clean their apartment, something is clearly wrong. I think the reason imposter syndrome has become so widespread is because there's a juxtaposition in everyday life that didn't used to be there. Imagine it this way. You're 35, 10 years out of college, scraping by while you make your student loan payments. Your loan balance is now $20,000 higher than the original $80,000 principal, despite paying hundreds into it each month because of interest. After 10 years of grinding in your industry, the boomers have finally started letting go of their corporate jobs and you snatch one of them up. You're now the senior managerial strategist of management at Business Incorporated. You spend your days in a fancy office building in a fancy city surrounded by luxury, directing a team of people reporting to the vice president of this huge powerful company. Corporations love making every job sound like it's the most important and advanced thing ever. You're not a manager, you're a neurosurgeon of managerial synergy and ad hoc data analysis where you meet your quarterly targets for stakeholders. So you're going to work where you're made to feel like the world hinges on your job performance. You're going to company dinners at five-star restaurants. You work downtown surrounded by luxury retail. There's a Gucci store across the street from your office. Yet simultaneously, you're being called by collections because you went to the hospital in January. You drive a 20-year-old Honda Civic that runs on prior alone. Because renting an apartment within an hour of Business Incorporated's global headquarters is taking up over half of your salary. You're making $75,000 a year, which sounded like a dream when you were in college, but now you find yourself binging TikTok videos on how to feed yourself from the dollar store because you're trying to save for a condo on the rough side of town. Then one day your landlord calls and your rent is going up from $2,800 a month to $3,600 a month. And there goes your dreams of someday owning a 400 square foot condo next to the methadone clinic. You no longer have any money to save. The juxtaposition between achieving your dream salary at your dream company, yet struggling to survive, is so palpable that it covers your life with a light veneer of disassociation. We find ourselves doing the things our parents did on paper, yet without any of the expected results. With each passing milestone, we think to ourselves, Oh yeah, I really just did achieve that milestone. Doesn't really feel like anything though. It probably doesn't help that we're being gaslit by society on an hourly basis. We're told we live in a meritocracy where if we just put the work in, we'll get the fruits of our labor. There's this whole ideology of getting on your grind set and working harder and longer hours than everyone else so you too can be Jeff Bezos and cheat on your wife. But if hard work paid off, we'd have more than a small handful of examples. There would be way more Jeff Bezos unfortunately, that'd be scary. Young people are beginning to understand this. As a result, we do our jobs with apathy. We take part in a dying system because we still need to survive, but we're definitely not passionate or giving it our 110%. Still, we're made to feel like we're going crazy. There's been a long-standing social pressure to not rock the boat, not to have strong opinions, or to act openly depressed with things. I think that's beginning to change, but for the time being, we're surrounded by people pretending like they're thriving well, we feel like we want to drive off a bridge on our way to Business Incorporated. We're languishing under the misery of late-stage capitalism. Life kind of just sucks right now, and it makes sense it's taking a toll on young people.
core of modern life is trying to do things by yourself that our ancestors did with the support of entire villages, and then wondering why you're tired all the time. An easy example is childcare. Women are expected to spend nine months being violently ill, followed by two years of postpartum mood instability, while maintaining a full-time career while raising a child, mostly by themselves for 18 years. In the past, we said it takes a village to raise a child. Now it supposedly takes just one or two people who are already working full-time jobs. Working parents used to be able to get childcare through their communities. Now we've turned that into a commodity that costs an average of $700 per week. But this is how capitalism works. We take basic needs and turn them into products wherever possible. We used to have public transit, but now we have cars that cost us over $10,000 a year. We used to have free community spaces or community-run dining halls, public pools, all of those things. Now we have dying malls, expensive coffee shops, or bars. We used to have trusted friends and loved ones. Now we pay monthly for AI chatbots that can be our friends or even our love interests. Think about how impossible it is to do anything without spending money. This change really happened in the 20th century with the rise of suburbs and rampant individualism. Gen Z has been really slow to get driver's licenses. Just 25% of 16 year olds have one now. It makes sense when you think about it. With 63% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, most families are not buying their 16 year old a car anymore. They can't even save any money, let alone car money. Even Zoomers that have cars can't can't exactly afford to go anywhere. I've had this issue many times as an adult. I look at my husband on a Saturday morning and go, what are we even gonna do today? We can't afford the gas to take like a day trip like we used to do. We can't afford a concert or really any other type of event. We could go thrifting, but I'm pretty tired of walking around the same three Goodwills every weekend thinking, wow, that looks cool. Hopefully it'll still be there next paycheck. So as usual, I end up taking a special gummy and watching Netflix all day. We're increasingly directed to the internet for what leisure time we have left. This is true for teenagers as much as it is for adults. How exactly are you going to go catch a ride and meet up with friends when you're 15 and your parents are both working two jobs to make rent? I think tech does help in this regard to some extent. Online games paired with voice chat are much better than nothing when it comes to socialization. But if this is your only way to be with your friends as a teenager, you're likely going to end up socially underdeveloped. Also, a lot of people aren't using the internet as a way to hang out with school or work friends without spending money. A lot of people are trying to meet their social needs through heavy social media use alone. Google is playing some really important roles these days, from therapists to triage nurse. Most of us don't have doctors we can just call with questions anymore, so now we're making medical decisions with a computer. Again, this is better than nothing, but a computer should not be our only option when we need to do things. And I feel like that's a theme with where we are these days. Technology does benefit our lives in a lot of ways, but it's also being misapplied as a replacement to essential things needed to survive. Not to mention the dangers of giving a search and discovery algorithm the power of being the first person we turn to with our life's questions. This is where the social media stuff I was talking about earlier comes back into focus. Earlier in this video, I talked about how social media platforms are ultimately here to make money. And so they designed the platforms to be as addictive as possible to keep you on for longer so you can see more ads and give them more user data to sell. Well, one of the ways they keep you engaged is with controversy. Controversial content is generally suppressed and banned from social media platforms. The mentality is if YouTube is promoting too many epic gamer moments, Nestle might not want to advertise their child labor chocolate on YouTube. It's just not a good look. Now, personally, I think Johnson & Johnson has a lot more to worry about than their baby powder advertisements being shown before a video where someone says F a few times. Like, maybe first worry about the asbestos in the baby powder or the child labor you're using to manufacture it, but I guess that's just me, being an ethical little Gen Z consumer. As a result, these platforms use AI to automatically flag content for suppression or removal. The problem is a ton of minorities are being shunned off the platform for merely talking about their own experiences. A gay man might want to make a video about what I guess I'll call um, 
home of phobia, and that will get suppressed for being controversial. A small creator will make a video about current events, and that will be deemed as misinformation and also suppressed or banned. So, okay, no controversial content, or discussing current events, or talking about race, or sexuality, or gender identity. Got it. YouTube is just a platform for weird AI-generated kids videos about getting pregnant for some reason. That's what we gotta do now. On this episode of Finding Subtext, Trending intellectual property gets microchipped with used epidermic needles. So the post-adpocalypse internet is going to be safe and family friendly. But the algorithm still prioritizes content that gets a lot of interaction, like comments or shares. And controversy is usually the thing that motivates the most discussion. See the problem here? As a result, the breeders get to discuss a lot about those of us deemed controversial. These influencers aren't deeply analyzing heavy subjects in a way that would trigger suppression. Rather, they talk about random fringe issues that have yet to make their way into a suppression database and somehow link those back to minorities. Actually, let's just compare the two approaches here. For the sake of this video, we're going to pretend this is a server room of some huge social media company. The monitor on the right will display what these moderation systems think of the content displayed on the left monitor. This hypothetical moderation system has three states. It can deem a video advertiser friendly, suppressed, or banned. Obviously, the moderation systems that real apps and websites use is a lot more advanced than this but I think this is a good way to display how these systems generally react to certain types of content. Hey, I just want to get on here and talk about all of the misinformation regarding current event. It seems like, especially on social media, as a queer person, I'm getting really concerned about the rhetoric against our community being mainstreamed. Welcome to The John Smith Show, where the forbidden truth is exposed. We cover things no one else is brave enough to talk about, because if you follow the truth, you'll get cancelled, leaving you unable to show your face in public or even make a modest living. So The Daily Pulse has just renewed my $80 million contract, and so I thought we should just build a new soundstage while we're at it. What do you think? I just thought the last one was so modest. So now we're working out of a new production facility as part of a $20 million expansion plan sponsored by Exxon. Anyways, in today's suppressed, borderline illegal show, we'll be looking at Gen Z's disturbing TikTok videos. Your children are in danger. Hi, I'm gay and I think I should be allowed to exist. Wow. That's cringe. I hope these people get dealt with, if you know what I mean. These people want your kids, and so do we, which is why after just six monthly payments of $49.99.95, you can gain access to the Daily Pulse Education Collection. Homeschool your kids with facts and logic on your side. When you talk about real issues with actual nuance, you can't use vague controversial language like, these people need to be dealt with. If you're one of these people, in order to talk about your experiences or your community's history, you're forced to use precise language to do so. Hateful rhetoric has the advantage of not needing to be logical or accurate to be effective. You can just say, these people are cringe, and leave it at that. No algorithm trigger words needed. Whereas, if you're trying to refute hateful rhetoric, you have to use real words to dismantle the claims being made against you. As a result, only controversial content that uses extremely vague language to get its point across ends up succeeding online, which is typically going to be hateful content. With the internet being the first point of contact for our questions, and by extension, the arbiter of public opinion, this is really concerning. Take a generation that's grappling with mental health at unprecedented rates, combined with search and discovery algorithms being the first point of contact, and you have a crisis on your hands. Hey, I just want to get on here and talk about my personal experience with mental health for anyone else who's struggling out there. I was struggling for several years, and I tried just about anything. I tried therapy, I tried any treatments my psychiatrist could throw at me, and nothing seemed like it was working. So as a last resort, I ended up trying one of those infusion places, which I was really nervous to do, but it ended up being 
If you're sad or whatever, that's just the alpha in you saying you need to get back on your grind. Every day by 4 a.m., I've sucked off 12 cigars for that testosterone boost and edged for two hours before my morning workout. Then I open a laptop in a vaguely tropical location, check my drop shipping numbers, and then snap a photo for Insta to attract more women for my collection. That's me getting on my grind, and you can join me by becoming a member of Alpha University. Oh my god, I can't do this. I've spent like three years trying to unlearn the straight accent I've been forcing since I was 16, and now I just cannot sound straight even if I try. Stragus need to just start talking normal. Anyways, I think you can see what I'm trying to illustrate here. Teenagers, especially teen boys, are turning to the internet for help. Content promoting specific treatments or even just talking specifically about certain conditions are often suppressed. Whereas content selling you the just lift bro method is boosted heavily. There are some rare instances where the companies actually step in and ban divisive content creators, but that doesn't always work. Andrew a bald by choice alpha male self-help influencer was banned off major platforms last year. Andrew responded by having all the members of his $50 a month get rich quick class repost his videos to their thousands of personal profiles. What would you do if your son was gay? If he was a gay rights activist and he was walking around in bondage gear on a gay pride parade in public, then I would disown him. Not because he's gay, but because he's degenerate as a person. I don't like degeneracy. I think degeneracy is repulsive. Because of Andrew's vague language controversial content being a perfect fit for algorithms, this approach has actually made his social media empire even more successful despite being banned. People are isolated. The majority of Americans are only meeting with their friends once a month or less. There's more people who never see their friends than people who meet a friend on a daily basis. While data for Gen Z specifically is pretty hard to come by, we do know today's young people aren't partying, dating, getting married, or doing anything that requires socializing nearly as much as previous cohorts. When you're that isolated, you're not gonna feel so good, and that discomfort is very marketable. Wellness and self-care products have become a $1.5 trillion industry. This can be anything from essential oils to $100 self-help guides sold to desperate teen boys on TikTok. We're constantly refining ourselves in the distorted mirror of our phones, making sure we have the clearest skin or the best physique to impress the imaginary friends or love interests that we one day might have. We follow all these trends. We go on a keto diet, we buy derma royals, hydrating serums, day creams, night creams, gym memberships, meal plans, personal trainers, supplements. And what does this do for us? Why are we training for being worthy of others like it's an Olympic sport? Well, I think it's partly because of social media giving us unrealistic expectations. However, I think the primary reason is because we're lonely, poor, and miserable, and this is where the algorithms channel our despair. Community happens mostly offline, whereas vapid self-improvement via commerce is maintained entirely within the walled gardens of social media algorithms. We're being sold individual solutions for widespread social problems. So the video ends here, right? Gen Z is miserable due to a dread mix of social media, economic decay, social unrest, and isolation. That seems like a good explanation for why we're struggling so severely. Well, there's one more angle I'd like to look at, one that's a bit more controversial and opinionated. Now, this is the end of the video, and like a lot of my videos that ramble on for over an hour, I like to make the last chapter more of an opinion thing. So bear with me, I'd like to go on a few tangents that I promise will be important to the topic here. When I was a kid, I used to look to my parents and the adults around me with judgment and confusion. My father would go to work every day for eight to 14 hours doing a job he hated that seemed absolutely useless. He'd come home and remain enslaved by the computer. Even if we traveled, we could only stay at hotels with internet in the rooms which was actually limiting in the 2000s, unlike today where it seems like even the enemas at CVS come with Wi-Fi enabled. Over the following decade, I watched my father slowly wither away. No longer was he stopping at the gym on his way to work, seeing friends after work, or really doing anything with his life other than go to work and hopefully come home afterwards. 
After work, he was an empty shell. He'd walk through the door, throw his bags down, go straight to the freezer, and begin his nightly drinking sessions. He'd microwave the dinner served several hours prior, or just not eat, and stare at the TV until 1 a.m. just to do it all over again. He wasn't using his limited time on Earth to the fullest, rather, he was languishing as the days went by. My mother stopped working pretty early into my childhood, but despite that, as the years went by, her mental health seemingly deteriorated, and she seemed endlessly occupied with mundane responsibilities. I didn't understand. They had hopes and dreams. My mother was a professional artist around the time I was born, but 10 years later, she had completely stopped doing anything with her life. On the weekends, my parents would just fight or do nothing. Going out for lunch, was the height of our Saturdays. I'd look at them and think, okay, you did nothing all Saturday, let's now do something interesting while it's still Sunday. Not even for my sake, I just wanted to see them have a hobby, or friends, or something. Then my household fell apart. My parents separated for the second time and got their divorce during my teens. Once I turned 18, I moved to LA with no job, fully believing I could leave behind my messy upbringing and live my dreams unlike my parents. I thought I could just show up with no degree and end up in the film industry. It was pretty obvious I was raised by boomers. I didn't last long. I ended up moving to a different expensive city, this time miraculously landing a good, albeit underpaid position in the film industry. But then life happened. I worked that job for years, making $22,000 a year barely surviving. I got married and changed careers. I worked crazy long hours, finding myself wrapping up work in the middle of the night. After a while, I eventually had a full-blown mental breakdown that genuinely should have put me in a grippy sock vacation, if we're being honest. Essentially, I unraveled for several months, and then had what can best be described as a panic attack, but it lasted for six weeks instead of 20 minutes. Like, it did not stop for even one minute for six weeks straight. It was that type of panic attack that makes you projectile vomit and can barely move. Then I just never fully went back to normal after that. I think that career might have actually altered my brain chemistry a bit. I kept working for almost a year, literally sobbing on my way to work. And that means something. I was from the I'll give you something to cry about generation. Over several months, I found myself spiraling towards a second massive breakdown. And I wasn't sure if I could survive that, so I took a ton of fungal remedies from the internet. Those vitamins somehow made me realize I need to stop chasing my dreams or else I'll keep irreparably damaging myself. So I quit the creative industry entirely and started college where I study my ass off just to hopefully work a boring job someday. I'm becoming my parents in a lot of ways. I get home from college, study until midnight, have like one hour where I aggressively consume special grass and then pass out. I'm not living my dreams. I'm languishing under late stage capitalism while I try my best to do exactly what I'm supposed to do. Even if that's a really tall order, like going to school with my several learning disorders with absolutely no accommodations offered. My professors tell me to jump and my enthusiastic response is how high? I can feel myself being transformed into a good little worker ready to oil the machine of capitalism. When I was a kid, I noticed some sort of weird shared misery the adults all bonded over. It's like they were on a different wavelength than I was. They would make little quips or jokes that would stimulate a pained understanding laughter from everyone in the room. Now I find myself ascending into that wavelength. I catch myself saying things like, oh, it's almost April, or thank God we have three pay periods this month. And I realize we are all on plan Z here. We all had lofty dreams, hobbies, and passions. And then we turned 18 and had them systematically stripped from us due to circumstance. Capitalism doesn't care if you want to be an artist when you grow up. Most people never get their big break, no matter how hard they work. Even if your dreams were simple, like wanting to be a doctor to help people, well, medical school costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Your hours will be long and you'll barely get to see your family until you retire. Your job will be dictated by insurance companies as you have to forego everything you learned in medical school to squeeze into a for-profit bureaucracy. But hey, at least you'll make that six-figure doctor's salary, which will slowly be withered away by inflation. God, I must just be sounding so negative and miserable at this point. That's because I am. I specialize in being a negative I'm doing absolutely 
Terribly, thank you for asking. Every passing day, I feel like the main character of a TV show that's on its 10th season. Like, we should have wrapped this up years ago. I'm not living. I'm trying to maintain my deteriorating meat suit. I clean and groom this meat suit every day. I go to the doctor and the dentist when I can afford it. And I work so my meat suit doesn't freeze or starve to death outside. You would think this meat suit would at least provide me with enough serotonin or some sort of chemical that would make me not want to drive into the ocean on my way to work. But no, this meat suit only releases good chemicals when I'm genuinely living a good life. Whatever that feels like. I mean, you can take shortcuts to release some of the feel-good chemicals, and I do try to do that, but I can't go too wild with it without breaking my god meat suit. I feel like I have zoocosis, a disorder where animals in a zoo become psychotic because they're made to live at complete odds with their natural needs. The suburbs are basically our zoo enclosure. Like, yeah, we have everything we need here, food, water, shelter, but we're still missing something crucial to build a happy life, a sense of community and aspirations. Deep down, we know we need these things, which is why we raise our kids in communal settings with common goals and try to help them build hopes and and dreams. Then they enter the adult world with no preparation or prior knowledge that it was this bad out there. Common sayings like high school is the best years of your life or wait until you enter the real world should not have been things I shrugged off at 14 years old. They were major red flags of how miserable adulthood really is. One of the studies that justified the War on wacky materials in the 1980s was an experiment where caged rats were given two water bottles. One had regular water and the other had what I'll call um, quirky additives, I guess. I really hate that I can't say actual specific words. The additives were both psycho and they were also active. The rats chose to drink the quirky water until their bodies gave up. This was used to justify a punitive approach to using wacky materials beginning in the late 1970s. In case you don't know what I mean, these uh, substances were things that you could not even try even once without risking something, you know? Like the whole dare thing um, and, and what you learn in like middle school. Please, please just understand. <laughs> the problem was the experiment was really flawed in a way most people didn't notice. The rats were isolated in tiny cages that only met their biological needs. One researcher noticed this and tried the experiment again. This time he made Rat Park, a utopia for rats with plenty of space for physical activity, toys for mental stimulation, and most importantly, several other rats for socializing and community. With all 16 rats participating together in the Rat Park experiment, instead of being separated in tiny boring cages like the original experiment, not a single rat died from consuming too much laced water. Instead, they used the water recreationally, only on occasion, and otherwise lived happy, successful lives. They tried adding sugar to the laced water, and the rats still limited their consumption to very small amounts. In another experiment, they took rats that were already dependent on the laced water and brought them into Rat Park. And despite their severe withdrawal symptoms, they still preferred to avoid the laced water. I think all of us are the isolated rats, except instead of dingy small cages, we're cramped into $2,000 a month studio apartments with no financial ability to leave other than to go to work. At least these commie rats got free food and housing even in the original experiment. Because yeah, Gen Z or just young people in general are so miserable right now. Statistics are all over the place, but according to a study of Gen Z adults aged 18 to 24 in 2022, 42% have been diagnosed with a mental health condition. Of these conditions, 90% had anxiety and 78% had depression. That's just the people who have been formally diagnosed, which Gen Z is less likely to seek professional help than any other generation, probably because it's expensive and difficult. More general surveys have found the majority of millennials and Gen Z are suffering with anxiety, and Gen Z particularly is grappling with depression at far higher rates than other cohorts. Having a sense of community is one of the biggest environmental predictors of both mental and physical health. Yet we're being robbed of our communities with suburban design and economic system keeping us isolated. We need a rat park approach to our environment. This means affordable communal living with activities and limited stressors. I think the human version of rat park under capitalism was supposed to be shopping malls, but like, 
who can afford to go shopping anymore? And also, you still have to have a car to get there. And if you're a child, that means bumming a ride. And no one can trust their kids to like go to the mall by themselves anymore. And like, they're also all dying because they've been replaced by the internet. It's just not a viable solution. We need. Just give me a rat park. Put me in an enclosure, please. <laughs> Gen Z is more isolated than ever and can only look back at fuzzy childhood memories for a time when living felt good. Until we can stop propping up a dying economic and social system at the expense of young people, we're only going to see worse and worse outcomes. Signs far more severe than a fascination with liminal spaces. Anyway, that'll be it for this video. I always wanna know what my viewers thought about these videos, so remember to leave a comment down below. I read all of them. Like and subscribe and just appease the algorithm so I don't get suppressed anymore. And remember to check out my website for a transcript of this video, the sources cited for this video, and any other information for every video that I'm uploading. You can also contact me directly through my website and I read all of my contacts. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Thank you.